Hello everyone from Trinity Church and beyond. A couple of announcements that I want to share before I pray and share a message. First off, um, stay tuned at the end of my message for a song by the Fifth Sunday Quartet here from our church. It was recorded sometime in the past and thanks for Al to, for saving that. Also, I want to thank everyone who's been sending in or dropping by uh, their envelopes with tithes and offerings in it and glad that you can continue to support the church in this time because there are expenses that we have. And then the third thing I want to mention is on a separate recording that you can find on either uh, Facebook or YouTube under the Lapeer Trinity Chapel is a message that Debbie Muldoon has prepared, a godly play message for the children. So gather your children around and watch with them as Debbie shares that message. Would you bow with me for prayer, please? Lord, we thank you that we can worship you wherever we are. We thank you that through your Holy Spirit, you can bind us together, even when we're in a very, very spread apart situation. Thank you that we can be together in this way through the electronics that are available. Bind our families together as we are together more than we're used to and keep us in your care until we can meet again. We give this time to you. May you speak through the power of your Holy Spirit to our hearts. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the context of today's scripture that I'm going to share is the night when Jesus shared what we call the Last Supper with his disciples, when he instituted Holy Communion for all of us to practice. And I look forward to when we can be together again to have communion together. Jesus had washed his disciples' feet before this meal because he wanted to talk to them and show them about being a servant. Judas at some point slipped away to find the Jewish officials because he was betraying Jesus and wanted Jesus to be arrested. And then in this context of this scripture, it's just 10, maybe 11 hours before he's crucified. This was a crucial night for Jesus on a personal basis and a crucial night for all of humanity on a spiritual basis. So here from Matthew chapter 26, and I'll be reading verses 36 through 46. So 26, 36, and 46 all together. It says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me while I pray. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinner. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So Jesus takes the 11 disciples, because Judas had already left, and they went from the upper room where they'd shared the Last Supper together out to the Garden of Gethsemane in order to pray. Jesus then took three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, a little further into the garden with him. Jesus came back to them three times to discover that the disciples were sleeping instead of praying. 
Jesus then made a statement that summarized what both he and the disciples were all experiencing on that night when he said, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Or as many of us, when we grew up, heard the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Certainly the disciples wanted to support Jesus on that night, but it was late. It had been a very eventful day and an eventful supper together. Jesus had spoken many profound things, many words to them to try to prepare them for what was going to happen next. They were both physically and emotionally tired. Their spirits were willing, but their eyelids were too heavy. We know what that is like. We are too tired to get up early in the morning to read our Bibles and pray, or we're too tired at night before going to bed to do those things. During worship on Sunday mornings, when we're gathered together, some of you have trouble keeping your eyes open, and I don't think that you're praying. I think you're nodding off. So we know a little bit about what the disciples were experiencing. Jesus himself was feeling weak in his mind, in his body that night. It shows us the human side of God in the flesh. For you see, Jesus was not a machine. Even though he had known since the creation of the world that he would be crucified, when he was with the heavenly Father praying to him that night, he wanted out of the plan. He wanted a different plan. He didn't want to have to go through what he was facing because he knew and could see in his mind's eye about the beatings and the mocking and the crown of thorns. He can imagine and see in his mind's eye the pain and the shame of the cross. Any of us can understand why Jesus wanted out as he prayed. But there was something even worse than the physical pain he was going to experience. There would be a time on the cross when there would have to be a separation between God the Father and God the Son. Because Jesus was taking the sin of the world upon himself. He was placing our sin on him. Even though he had no sin, he was taking ours. And because of the holiness and the morality and the purity of God the Father, there would be a time when God would have to turn away from all the filth of humanity's sin. He would not be able to look at it for a time. And at that moment, Jesus would feel so alone. That was the moment that Jesus, I believe, dreaded more than anything else, even though everything else was terrible few verses from the book called Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Hear these words. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted." So here we read and are reminded that Jesus can help us in our struggles, in our temptations, in our pain, because he understands. He went through those same types of things. He has been there. The four Gospels show us that Jesus had times of loneliness, sorrow, rejection, and temptation. Yet in these situations, and in the situation that night in the garden, when the disciples could not overcome the weaknesses of their flesh, Jesus did. And one of the ways he did that, a key for that, was praying the prayer, not as I will, 
but as you will. Not my will, but yours be done. Lord, not what I want, but what you want for me. It's the perfect prayer. Perfect prayer. How different might our lives be if we made that prayer a daily habit? Just think of the areas in our lives that could be improved by praying, Lord, not my will, but let your will be applied to my life. Church committees would be more effective and less stressful if every member came to that committee meeting praying, Lord, not what I want, but let your will be done in this committee meeting. Our workplace could be improved, more enjoyable even, if we were able to pray that prayer, even if it's silently in our minds, in our heads. Marriages would be more fulfilling, stable, and long-lasting if husbands and wives applied the perfect prayer to their home life. And when families are together more than they've been in quite a while, may we especially practice this prayer together. Our finances would be better balanced if we asked God and God's will in the way that we spend our money and in the way we support the many ministries here at Trinity Church. But I need to warn you, this is a very risky prayer. Look at what God's will was for Jesus. It was the cross. Some of us fail to follow the will of God because it might cause a change in our schedule or it might cause us some sleep on Sunday morning. It might change the way we spend our money. It might require a change in the way we treat the members of our family if we truly prayed and obeyed. Not my will, but yours be done. God's will for us might be embarrassing, it might be inconvenient, it might cause some change, but Jesus gave his life by following the Lord's will for us. We have a spiritual choice to make today. We can either choose to live a selfish, comfortable, less fruitful, less victorious, less joyful Christian life, or we can choose to follow the example of Jesus and make a habit of praying his perfect prayer, not my will, but thine be done. So what might you need to turn over to the Lord today? Things that maybe you're doing it your way instead of God's way. Is it your relationship with your spouse or a child, a fellow worker, significant other, a fellow church member? Do you need to turn over your goals and your future to him? Is it a habit or an activity or an attitude that you know does not please God? And it's time to say, no longer my way, but your way, Lord. This amazing yet challenging prayer of Jesus could transform all of our lives for the better. Make us more like Jesus in our daily living. So as you think about the experiences and the words that we read from the scriptures today, find encouragement in the fact that Jesus understands human life with all of its challenges. And because of that, he wants to and can help us as we go through the challenges of life. Do not copy the action of the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. Don't sleep when you should be praying. But do copy the action of Jesus that night in the garden. Pray the perfect prayer. He was struggling. He was scared. He did not want to do what God wanted him to do. But eventually, he said, what you want, not what I want. So I hope that we can make a habit in our personal prayer life, in our personal actions, to say, Lord, not my will, 
but yours be done. Would you bow with me for prayer? Lord, thank you so much for the example of Jesus. Thank you that we do not have to go through life on our own. Thank you that we have a Savior who understands. And I pray that you would help us to get into this habit of praying the perfect prayer. I pray for all who are hearing my voice, that they would hear your voice and that they would feel your direction in their life. Bind us together in your spirit. Help us to be your people and to love on people even though we are not able to get out much. All these things I pray and lift in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. God bless you. Once I traveled in the valley so low, so And I'll reach the other side